Uh, hi friends, a very good evening and thank you for joining in. Uh, could you just confirm in the chat window if everything is working as expected so that uh, we can have a little bit of Q&A for a few minutes and then actually dive into the live session itself. So it would be good if you can confirm on the chat window if I'm visible and clearly audible. Okay. Good, good, good. I can see myself on my phone. So I'm assuming uh, there are no technical glitches. Hey folks, uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, as usual, since some of us are a little early, uh, let's, I mean, I'm open to some general questions and feel free to ask questions and then um, uh, uh, probably at 7.02 or 7.03, we will start with the actual problems themselves. Gaurav is saying last minute tips for triple ITH exam. Just revise uh, the notes that you have written for data structures algorithms quickly and get a good night's sleep. That is super duper important just before the examination. Okay. Uh, uh, Deepyan has a very nice question. How to get back on track when you lose focus? This happens to all of us, Deepyan. So uh, again, a uh, standard strategy that I try to employ is uh, the night before I write a schedule for myself, especially if I feel that I'm losing track and I'm not working to my best potential. I write the next day's plan, the before day itself. And at every touch point, for example, imagine from, I typically try to get some of my work done early in the morning. So imagine if, I, if I'm if i doing some work done, if I get my work done between 5 to 9 a.m., then I, I, I mean, I, I indulge in something that I like to do. For example, I like to eat sugary sweets. So I, I just, uh, I just order, thanks to Swiggy and Zomato, I just order some Kubanika Mita early in the morning or some uh, or some Jalebi with Rabudi. And I think, okay, great, let's 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 feast on it. So these are small, what do you call it, um, presents I give myself just to get back on track. Of course, I can't do it every day because otherwise um, my blood sugar levels will shoot up. But I try to do it, especially when I when I know I'm falling falling behind track. So maybe first couple of days, I'll say, hey, if I do this, I'll make myself some fruit juice or I'll get myself the best food that I can, something that I like to eat. Again, I'm a big foodie. So food is a big part of uh, what I enjoy. So again, so th that's how I do it. Um, again, this is a standard strategy of uh, trying to build that habit and reward yourself uh, when you get it done. Th this works brilliantly well for me. Of course, your incentive and your reward could be very different from mine. But it works fairly well. Somebody is asking about GitHub Copilot. Will it eat all the jobs of software engineer? Not at all, Bithu. Uh, I've gone through that. Uh, I've gone through uh, the newly released uh, GitHub. Uh, it's called, I, 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 it's, it's basically a code helper, which is using some uh, state of the art deep learning models to help you write code better. But it doesn't think logically because uh, I understand how GPT models work. Again, we have studied them in our AI course, uh, including the original research papers behind GPT-2 and GPT-3. I think uh, they will surely improve the efficiency of software engineers, but we are no way close to replacing them. I mean, that's very, very far away. That requires truly human level intelligence. And I don't think anybody thinks uh, the state of the art GPT models are anywhere close to uh, human level intelligence or even close to it. So. I mean, I don't think we are anywhere close to that. So don't worry about it. Uh, so uh, Sashidhar asks, uh, after GATE, will we have an interview in IITs for some M.Tech programs? Yes. Depending on the M.Tech or the, there are some M.Tech programs which are research oriented. Also, some universities have interviews. I think in the last couple of years, uh, most of these interviews have been cancelled because, uh, because, because of COVID restrictions. Uh, yes, but earlier there are some programs in some universities which are not just gate rank based, they also have interviews. But if you get a good enough gate rank, you have all the skills. Again, there will be some weightage to the gate rank and the interview. This happens to, this happens if I'm not wrong, at triple is also. So, um, but if you have, if you have gotten a good gate rank, if you have the strong foundations, it should be straightforward to crack most of these interviews. Uh, somebody is asking about exams like ISRO and DRDO. Uh, we have some uh, live sessions and interactive sessions with some of our students who cracked these institutes 
and other PSUs in the previous years. Again, their examination pattern hasn't changed much. The level of examination hasn't changed much. So those videos which were recorded sometime last year are also relevant now. So please go check them out and we will try to do more in the near future. Uh, Varun says, I'm finding it difficult to manage revision and studying new subjects. I think uh, the formula is very simple, right? Every week, two to three hours for revising everything you learnt in the week. Every month, two to three days for revising everything you learnt in the month. And every three months, maybe a week to revise everything you learnt in the month. Sorry, everything you learnt in the three months. I think that's a simple formula. Just try to just try to uh, use that Varun. I'm I'm sure it will. Again, instead of two to three hours, you might require four to five hours. I mean that that is very uh, that is very person dependent. But the weekly, monthly, quarterly model typically tends to work very very well. Cool. Um, so uh, somebody is asking about Niti Bombay. Uh, Again, I, I don't have first-hand knowledge of it, but some of my teammates, uh, they have done extensive research on all the institutes, including NITI. So I don't want to comment something which is incorrect because I don't have it at the top of my head. But uh, please reach out to us over email and one of our teammates who has studied about NITI, about the coursework, about the placements, about career opportunities, they can give you a more precise answer about where it stands. That, that's better because I don't recall I remember one of my teammates actually doing that analysis, but I don't remember it at the top of my head. So somebody is asking, is DS and Algo notes uh, enough for any exam? So uh, uh, Krithika, uh, it's, it's more than enough for GATE or related exams, whether it's ISRO, DRDO, IIITH, ISI, Kolkata. So most of these institutes, the examination level is roughly the same. Again, some, in some uh, examinations, they might ask you more coding or less coding, more math, less math and things like that. But in general, uh, GATE, is like, uh, GATE is like the baseline which most other institutes also use to set their own question papers and levels. So I think it would be fairly sufficient for most, uh, uh, for most government organizations like DRDO ISRO and also for uh, institutes that have their own entrance exams like IIITs. Uh, Rakesh says, uh, it's becoming hard to follow the same routine every day. How to stay motivated? Again, uh, there is this very famous quotation. I don't know who said it. I don't recall who said it. That motivation, which is external, uh, will not last long. It's just like pleasure. It's not like happiness. It's like eating some good food, right? So what is more important is to think of the long term why you're working. Ask yourself or remind yourself regularly on why you are putting this effort consistently day over day. Again, um, Rome wasn't built in a day and it takes it takes many, many days and weeks of effort. So please don't lose that, that, that farther goal that is ahead of you. We see a lot of really smart students who give up in between, who think, hey, this is getting boring. Why should I do it? But keep, keep sight of the ultimate goal that you're trying to track and remind yourself on a regular basis, maybe every day or every week, there is also this technique in psychology called visualization. Visualize yourself writing the gate examination, getting good marks, getting into a top university. Visualize that. But of course, don't just dream. Put that into action by actually putting in the hours of effort needed. I mean, at the end of the day, if you ask me, do the smartest kids make it to gate? I would say no. It is a people who are persistent and who have the grit. In the long run, again, there is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of study in education and careers that people who succeed in the long run are not people who are the smartest, but people who have persistence and grit, right? So you have to be persistent. There is no escaping that fact, right? So, I mean, that's something that you will have to drill it into your head through visualization or, I mean, take, 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 a, few, take a few minutes away every day and tell yourself why you're doing this. Again, this might seem like uh, some gyan, but this works. I've, I've, I've gone through the similar stage. Like uh, when we are doing gate content, I'll give you a nice example. Gate content is humongous, right? If you think about it, and the first time we were doing it, uh, we literally, the whole team, uh, we, did, we did the whole gate content in about seven months, if I'm not wrong, seven, seven and a half months. When we started, we felt, wow, this is like literally 400 hours of content and we have to do it very, very good, very, very carefully, really world-class content we have to create. 
the challenge felt so daunting but then we said okay every day the team would collect all the all the good pointers good examples from textbooks good ways of teaching a concept and they will accumulate all of it the day before next day morning i wake up at 4 i sit through the day literally from 4 am to 4 pm was the time i was taking to create like 2 3 hours of content right and then i would take a break uh, later in the afternoon and i i had a small kid at that time so it it was really really hard um uh, and it was not just hard for me it was hard for whole of my team because imagine my team had to read uh, te- standard textbooks wikipedia online resources so at one point we thought wow this is getting just too hard for us given all the constraints that we have but we were very clear that we wanted to create the best content at undergraduate level computer science so we kept that long term goal and all of us struggled through this journey so we had our own times of ups and downs i mean it was it was one of the most challenging things i've done in the last 2 to 3 years which is literally create most of the gate content in about 7 months that's by uh, that's by no means easy it it was it was really really challenging but the end goal was what kept me motivated i always visualized every two days saying hey we have to create this brilliant course and we have to stay we we, we can't lose focus of the end goal and we also had students uh, who were trusting us so i can't i can't i can't burst their trust that's super duper important for us so we all go through that journey whether it you whether me or any of us we all go through that it's just a phase always keep track of the long term vision and don't give up that's all simple as that uh it's 705 i'm sorry uh chirag i'm happy you reminded me of it so let's let's go into the questions okay so we'll come back to general q and a in a few minutes i'll start sharing my screen uh can can you uh, can you just uh, uh, can you just confirm if my screen is visible and if i'm audible i'm just changing the the inputs if you just confirm that we'll get started uh can you just confirm if the screen is visible so that we can get started cool cool let's get started i got a little carried away with the questions uh anyway so as usual uh, we will solve the five questions and have a general q and a at the end so that uh, we can accommodate everyone's needs okay so this is the third live session of i believe uh, six live sessions or seven live sessions for data structures and algorithms the topics are straightforward simple ones so let's get started so here is the first question please read the question very carefully okay please read this question very carefully super duper important It's okay take your time read the question carefully and let's answer it I'll wait for sufficiently good number of students answering it in the chat window and then I'll go to the solution No, it's not. Think about it. I agree that this question is slightly tricky, but once you see the solution, you'll see. Hey, is it just this? 
So the question is not hard, it is just tricky. So that's why I've asked you, read it carefully. Read it carefully. This question is like a medium level hardness with trickiness in it. But if you think through carefully, it's literally like uh, you can solve it in like three, three minutes or so. I see a varied list of answers. But let's see, let's see. Again, these are a very special type of questions which at the outset will feel like very hard. But when you work it out in detail, they actually are simple. I won't say simple, they are medium level hardness. I see some of you getting the right answer. Of course, there are also a good number of you who didn't get it. So please retry, please revisit your answer. Again, don't worry about it. We have some easy questions also. This is like a good two mark question by gate standards. So we'll have a mix of them so that you don't get demotivated. And we'll also be realistic with respect to the gate level. So I'll wait for a little while because I believe some of you are correcting your answers. Some of you are still solving it. This question, in addition being uh, for, uh, in addition being tricky to understand, there also very there are also a lot of scope. There is a lot of scope to make silly mistakes here, which I think some of you are doing. Okay, so I'll answer it in the interest of uh, everyone. So I think the question is the question is fairly clear. So we have two algorithms. Algorithm A makes use of a stack, right? It inserts into stack. It keeps pushing each of the characters in the string into stack, but it can pop at any time in between and print it. Algorithm B randomly interchanges characters. And what we have is basically a string S of length three, which has three unique characters. So let's just use A, B, C. Again, you could be A, B, C, B, A, C, whatever it is. Since each character is unique and the length is this, we can use any three characters here. So if you have these three characters, let's look at algorithm B first because it seems to be easy. How many ways can I arrange this, these characters if I randomly shuffle these? That's equivalent to the number of ways I can actually permute three characters, right? So I have three positions. In the first position, I can place any of the three characters. In the second place, I can place any of the remaining two characters. In the third place, I can, I'll have to place only the leftover character. So if, using, if you're using algorithm B, you can generate six unique shufflings or six unique strings from the original string S, which is ABC. So from algorithm B, let's, keep, let's write that, right? From algorithm B, we can generate six unique uh, strings. Now, what about algorithm A, right? So, I mean, if, if you know from algorithm A what all strings you can generate, then computing the probability is just a division of one by the other, right? If I know if I know all the strings that algorithm A can generate, if I know all the strings that algorithm B can generate, if I just divide this number by this number, I get the probability. That's it. It's as simple as that. So, algorithm A, what all strings can it generate? 
okay so i will use u to represent push i will represent o for pop okay let's generate all the possible strings that we can so again remember we have three characters so there will be three push operations and three pop operations whenever we pop let's assume we also print so i can do push pop push pop push pop if i do this what is the final string that i'll generate so my string originally remember my string originally is a b c okay let's just assume this without with, with i mean without without loss of generality so i push a i pop a so i get a then i get b then i get c so this is one string that's possible now think of all the ways you can arrange push and pop operations as simple so i can do two push followed by two pop followed by push and pop so if i push two times and then pop once right so i push a and b i pop so i get b then again i pop right when i pop i get a then again i push and pop so i get b a c so it's all about arranging this push and pops in a in a valid orders you can't pop without pushing right that's not valid so the third thing that i can think of is push all three pop all three right so what would this generate this would generate c b a what else can be done you can push pop again push twice and pop twice so what would this generate a so you pushed b and c and then popped so you get c and then b so what are the combinations are possible push twice pop once push and pop this is an another possibility that you can do if you do this you get b because you do you did two pushes and then a pop so you get b then you pushed again so you have c then you get c then you get a so what are the total number of strings that are possible there are only six strings that are unique strings that are possible or there are only six uh, unique uh, permutations that are possible we already got five so what is the leftover let's let's understand that just to be sure that just to be sure we are not making a silly mistake so the only one that is left is c a b that's the only one that's left everything else we generated right there look, look at this you, if you have a as the first character you have b c c b so everything is done if you have b as the first character a c c a done if you have c as the first character you have b a but you don't have a b but can you generate this using any ordering of push and pop you can't right think about it logically right so to pop c first so you should have pushed all three otherwise you can't pop c right then you did a pop operation so you got your c then how can you get a because b will be at the top of the stack so you can't get ab in any possible way simple logic very very simple logic here right so this is the only one that's not possible which means using algorithm a there are five unique strings or five unique permutations that you can generate now the question says what is the probability that the string which was generated by b can also be generated by a it's just 5 by 6 i think uh, this will be equivalent to 0.833 if you are asked to round it to three decimal places right simple logic it's all about a simple counting exercise so this is a very nice problem in the intersection of counting or permutations and combinations plus stacks very simple problem again the counting that is involved here is not some rocket science counting it's simple permutations and combi even if you don't know what is a permutation and a combination you can still solve it because we are manually counting all possibilities right so very interesting question i enjoyed solving this i mean when i first read i thought hey this looks like a very hard question beyond the gate scope then but when i started putting it down and started solving this question i thought hey this is trivial this is easy it just it just is throwing you off guard throwing you out of your comfort zone okay so hope you enjoyed this cool let's go to the next question cool let's go here this is a very simple typical one mark question in gate you'll see lot of these types of questions in gate where they are just checking if you know how to how to do some operation in this case it is uh, from infix to postfix 
You'll also see this in other data structures and algorithms where they'll say, hey, if you're doing some minimum spanning tree, what is the answer and things like that. You just have to carefully do it. Again, our team is answering some of the follow-up questions uh, about the previous question. Anything that could not be answered here, feel free to email us, we'll clarify further. Very simple question. If you know how to convert from infix to postfix, this is straightforward. Most of you are getting it right. John will change that uh, in the next live session. So I think uh, the slow mode is meant so that people don't just spam the uh, spam the thread, but we'll we'll update it uh, in the next live session. Okay, I think uh, most of you got it right. I don't see anybody who got it incorrectly, which is good. This is like a straightforward two mark giveaway. Again, remember that gate typically, even in the last few years when there were more tricky questions, you would get about 50 to 55 marks of easy questions, questions that are easy to score marks in. So get those quickly because that will give you, even if you solve the medium questions, only a few of them, it will get you into good ranks. Anyway, let's solve this now. So here it's clearly given that the exponent has the highest priority, followed by the division and multiplication, followed by plus and minus, so very simple. So what? how do you do it? You just have a stack wherein you place all of these. So this is your stack S, all right? So you have, again, this stack is basically an operator stack. So all the operators are placed here. Operands like P are not placed. So you have your P here, then you have a, a division operator. So just place it here. Then you have a Q, good. Then you have a exponent, right? So th then what you have is an exponent, right? So uh, then you have an exponent. Then you have uh, an R. Right, so you place your R here, then what you get here is a plus. Now remember that plus has lower priority than exponent. So you pop this first, right? So you pop this, this is gone. Then even division has a higher priority than plus. So you also pop your division. Again, just go through this step by step because some of these questions can be made slightly tricky. So just use the steps, use the algorithm carefully. Then you push your plus. Then you have your S, right? So you just push, you just have your S, star has a higher priority than plus, so don't worry, just push it here. Then you have your T, then you have your minus. Minus has a lower priority than star, all right? So you just uh, pop star, again, minus has the same priority as plus, so you also pop plus, so your plus goes here, then you're left with your minus. So your minus goes here, then you get your P, then you get your star, star has a higher priority than minus, then you have your R, then you have your star and minus, right? It's very simple, you just have to keep track of the priorities, you just have to keep pushing things, pushing your operators into your stack and just popping them carefully, right? So very simple stuff. So cool, uh, where are we now? Uh, so PQR exponent slash ST star plus, okay, C is the right answer, very simple. Right, so very simple question, very easy to solve. Cool, so let's go to the third question now. Ha, this is a very nice question. So this is a typical two mark question in gate. Again, many variations of this question are very commonly found in the previous years. Again, uh, as usual, I will answer general questions at the end. So let's solve the questions now. Again, this is a standard two mark question, which is, which is in the combination of linked lists and pointers and C coding. So, very, very typical of gate.
again just think of the boundary cases carefully think of how you change the pointers and think of the boundary cases otherwise you'll make mistakes just read the code carefully yes i believe some variation of this was there in the scholarship test yes so somebody says how many ways can we reverse a linked list you can write uh, in terms of code you can write infinite variations of code to reverse a linked list because the code you write and code I write would be very different. It depends on the data structures you're using. It depends on the pointers that you're using. So there are infinitely many ways. And that's why these questions keep popping up with slight variations here and there. Again, you would see a very similar question probably two or three times in the last few years. Again, I request all of you Okay, it seems, oh, so it seems this is not the same question. One of our team members is confirming that uh, it was not the same question in the scholarship test, but similar question using some stack probably. Got it. Again, I see some of you making silly mistakes, so please read the code carefully. My suggestion to all of you, draw. Draw, draw a diagram of a linked list. That way you will not make silly mistakes. Okay, I see some of you correcting your answers. Good to see that always. We'll wait for a little more while and then we'll go into the solution itself. For any question with pointers, I always draw diagrams. I see most of you are either suggesting A or C. Okay, so let's actually solve this, right? It's actually a simple problem, but by gate standards, this is often considered a medium level problem because most students get confused with the pointer shufflings. So let's assume this is how we have it. This is a standard linked list. Let's just take, let's say a three element linked list. So this is pointing to null. And at the very outset, you're again, you're, point, you're passing a double pointer to the head reference. This is your head. And then you're saying my current initially, right? So th this is where my current is pointing to. My current will point to the head reference, right? So cool. So this part is this part is understood. Now you're saying next equals to initially null. Then you have a while condition. This is your one. So we'll come to while condition because while condition typically defines the boundary condition till when we should repeat this loop. We'll come to that in a minute. Now let's look at the first step. What does the first step say? The first step says next equals to current next. Okay, so next, okay, so the pointer next is now pointing to current next, right? So this is your current, this is the current next, whatever current next is pointing to, the next pointer is also pointing to that. Then there is some empty line. Then what is it saying? So we have to see what this empty line is. If you observe the second options, it's either current next equals to previous, this is one option we have, or we have this option, which is current next equals to previous next. This is also current next equals to previous. This is current next equals to previous next. Just what is previous right now? Let's look at it. Previous is now null. At this point, at this point, your previous is null. Now, if we execute, let's say this line, current next equals to previous next, this is meaningless because previous is pointing to null now. 
at this point, at the very outset, at the beginning of this loop, your previous, at this point, the moment we arrive here, previous is point to null. What is null next? That is meaningless. So this certainly can't be the answer. This cannot be what we fill here because it is meaningless. So that way you can easily eliminate option B. You can, sorry, my bad, my bad. Let me just erase this. So that way we can simply eliminate uh, option B and option D because their option twos are incorrect. You're only left with option A and C. Now we're eliminating, right? So what is the difference between option one and option two or option A and option C? Here it's checking for current next not equals to null. So this condition is differing between option A and option C. Rest everything. So if we, if we write now, okay, current next equals to previous. Okay, so let's assume we say this. Uh, right? That's what we are saying, right? Current next equals to previous. Okay, so current next equals to previous. So let's see what's happening here. Current next equals to previous basically means this pointer, this is your current next, is going to point to null. That's what you would do, right? If you're inverting a linked list, the head becomes the tail, the tail becomes the head, which means this becomes your null pointer, right? So it makes logical sense. It's working as expected. Next, at some point, you'll keep moving your, see, the logic here is your previous becomes current, current becomes next. So at any point, look at what's happening. At any point, your previous current and null are just going from one place to another place. So this is at the starting. At the ending, let's see what happens. Suppose this is your current, right? This will be your previous, right? Your next will point to null, right? Your next will now point to null. This, this will be the setup, right, at some point. Now, here, what should you do? Look at this. So there, there are two termination conditions. Current next equals to null. Is this the termination condition of the loop? Or should the, should the condition be current not equals to null? That, that's, that's the key here. So imagine if current next is not equal to null. But at this point, if the current is pointing to this, current next will be equal to null, which means you'll come out of the loop. Now, should we terminate when the current is pointing to this node or to null? That's the question that we have to decide now. Let's assume we terminate at this point. The problem here is this pointer is not yet pointing to this. This pointer is not yet pointing. So you should not terminate when current is pointing to this, right? Because this pointer will get updated to point to the previous one in this loop itself. So how can you terminate the loop without adjusting for this pointer? So this cannot be the right solution, right? You should only terminate when current is, again, this condition should be when current equals to null, terminate the loop. Otherwise, this last pointer, this last node's pointer will not get adjusted to point to this because that adjustment is happening within this loop itself as we have seen earlier. So A cannot be the right option, C is the right option. Now, whenever there is this problem like this, the simplest way to tackle problems like this to avoid silly mistakes. There are literally two ways. One, please draw the diagram. Next, look at the boundary cases. Look at what happens at the very beginning, at the very starting and at the very ending. Again, how, do, how did we eliminate options? Again, we eliminated B and D by looking at what happens at the very beginning when your current is actually pointing to this, right? So this is called handling boundary cases. And how did we eliminate option A and choose option C, right? How did we choose that? We chose this because otherwise this pointer will not get adjusted to point to this, as simple as that, right? So very simple logic. I hope, I hope this is clear. Okay, the most important thing to solve any of these problems is draw the diagrams, look at the starting and ending conditions because that's where things get tricky. Gate questions typically focus on the boundary conditions. These are often called as boundary conditions in any programming. Again, even if you're interviewing at most companies, if they ask you a simple question, again, this is considered a simple question, even at product-based companies, right? They might ask you a question like this and what they're checking for is your boundary conditions. Will your code work if your whole linked list is just empty linked list? How, how are you adjusting the pointers carefully at the beginning, at the end? So it's all about boundary conditions, especially if the program is straightforward like this, not a DP problem or some graph problem, right? So simple, very often, this type of question is very often asked in Git, just as a tricky question. But I don't think it's tricky if you know the strategy, which is draw diagrams, always think of boundary conditions. It's as simple as that. Cool, so let's go to the fourth question now. Ha, this is a very nice question. 
So this is very similar to a question that was asked in the last year gate exam. This is very similar to our last year uh, 2021 gate question actually. Not the same, I guess, but similar. Please read the question carefully. We have seen lot of students who made mistakes for this question last year. Some really good students who made silly mistakes on this. So this is a slightly tricky question. It's an easy question. It, it was I think asked for one mark if I'm not wrong. We have seen some really well prepared students making mistakes in this. So somebody is asking, is it stored row wise or column wise? By default, uh, assume uh, row major order because that's what most programming languages use today, by default. If it's not mentioned, just assume row major order. Column major is only used in the earlier languages like Fortran. Because C is in the gate syllabus, you should automatically assume that if something is not given, just assume C programming language. Again, if anything is not clearly mentioned, just fall back to C programming. I see three options primarily, A, C and D. Interesting. Oh, somebody says B also, okay. Again, I'll take the general questions at the end of this session. First, let's solve these, just solve these questions. We'll surely go into general questions later. Ask yourself one more question, folks. There's nothing mentioned about the, uh, the number of bytes required to store uh, any of these values in the matrix. So, yeah. So if, if it's not given, what, what, what would you assume? You can't assume they are integers because they could be float. Float typically takes about four bytes. Again, if you're using IEEE formats. Okay, so let me answer this. The correct answer for this question is a D. There is so much of missing information here right it's not given so that's that is a hint actually there is so much of missing info right that itself is a very big hint that you can't answer this question reliably that's a hint actually that's a very subtle hint because it's not telling you how many bytes are required it's saying some memory location 5000 but are we storing floating point values are we storing integers are we storing characters nothing is given that's a hint read that as a hint more importantly it says it's a lower triangular matrix. Okay, so if this is your matrix, look at only lower triangular elements. So if you have, so this array is uh, array indexing starts from one comma one, right? So you have one two three so on so forth, one two three so on so forth, right? In a lower triangular matrix, the upper triangle is zero. So you often don't store this information anywhere. Where is a fifteen seventeen? It's there in the upper triangular matrix. 
because only 15th row up to 15th column up to only 15th column there, there will be valid cells because that will be diagonal element so a1517 will not even be stored anywhere because by default by the definition that it's a lower triangular matrix this value is by default zero and you're trying to store this optimally it says somewhere right uh, is being stored optimally which means you'll never store this it's useless so none of the above you're not even going to store that's it it's that simple right so very simple question here again this is tricky by design and you can realize that it is tricky there is a very subtle hint that there is missing information so computing it is hard and even without getting that hint itself even if you just think this is a lower triangular matrix upper triangle elements have to be zero simple this was an actual again i think some variation of this question or probably very similar question was there in gate 2021 this is not a hard question this is an easy question just tricky so over the last two three years we are seeing more and more of these tricky questions to to actually get students to fall into these traps right because gate is saying hey if to be a good engineer you also have to be careful not to fall into tricky traps right so it's actually a silly question but from next time the takeaway is whenever there is qu any question about triangular matrices just ask yourself again i always draw this the moment somebody says lower triangular matrix i say this i draw this you'll see this in many of my course videos also i am i'm like a visual guy i draw now the moment you say 15 17 hey i know this is zero why would it even be stored if you don't draw this diagram it's very easy to get fooled so drawing diagrams is one way to avoid these silly mistakes cool this was i think a one mark question but a good one okay here is a nice variation question think about this this is a nice question again about arrays and matrices Again, one way to avoid silly mistakes is to draw, 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 draw. Even this question, if you draw it, you will get the answer much more easily. Please draw the diagram for these uh, toplitz matrix also. So this question only says the size of the array required to optimally store the toplitz matrix. It doesn't care about whether it's zero indexed or one indexed. You just have to say how many array elements do you need to store this. That's it. Again, remember that this is a toplitz matrix, which is five by five. It's a square matrix, but you may have non-square toplitz matrices which satisfy this condition. Again, please don't remember formulae because if the question slightly changes, everything goes for a toss. I can just define a new type of matrix and not a toplitz matrix. So try to derive these things from first principles. Some of you got the right answer. Some of you are applying formulae if I'm not wrong. Some of you got it wrong, but just rethink about it slightly. So we have 20 rows and 22 columns. So 
So this is 20 rows and 22 columns. So this is the Toplis matrix that we have. Uh, somebody is asking about cache aware algorithms. Uh, please keep that question right after this. I will answer that. It's a very nice question. There is no question of the day because in gate exam, it's not about getting one question right. It's about getting even easy questions right, like the fourth question, right? That's important. There might be some beautiful questions. Even if you don't solve it, you can still get a good gate rank. So don't fall into the trap of great questions. You just should solve questions at gate level across the spectrum, easy, medium, and tricky. Cool, so let's answer this, okay? So this is how our Toplitz matrix will look like. So if you think carefully, right? So my first diagonal will go from 1, 1 to 20, 20 because there are only 20 rows, right? So this is how my first diagonal will go. So when I store it into an array, I can first store my first diagonal. Like this is going from, again, I can just set a standard, right? I can fix a standard. First, I will store all these elements in the first location. So let's assume there is A here. I will store A. Then I'll go from 2 to 21. Look at this. I'll go to from uh, from this from this column i'll just go down all the way then from 3 i will go to again look look at this so from 1 comma 1 to 20 comma 20 from 1 comma 2 to uh, 20 comma 21 that's the other diagonal this is the other diagonal i'll keep having diagonals like this look at this i'll keep having these diagonals right if you think about it that's how my diagonals will be formed so when i write it first i will draw this diagonal then this diagonal, then this diagonal, so on and so forth, right? So let's call it A1, A2, so on and so forth. How many such diagonals are here? So we are starting with this 1, 2, 3. There are 22 such possibilities, right? So you will have A22. So there are 22 diagonals. If you think about them, you can, I mean, these are not exactly upper triangular because this is not a square matrix. But all this, so I'll first fill this value as A1 then this value as A2, this value as A3. If you just count carefully, the last one, there will be only one value in 22 comma, in 122, because there's no more diagonal to go below. So that will be, let's say, A22. So I have stored 22 values. Next, let's just flip and come to the downside. So next you'll go from two, from three, from four, from 19, and just 20. So these are all the other diagonals. So I will call this as A23, A24, or let's call them as Bs, right? Just to make the math simple. So we're doing all this upper, I mean, the upper part of it and the lower part of it. So let's say this is B1, B2, so on and so forth. So when you had two, you got B1. When you had three, you got B2. When you had four, you got B3. When you had 20, you'll get B19. So you have B1 up to B19. You just store these values. You fix the format. You say, first I will store this big diagonal, then I'll keep going this way, then I'll again come back and store all these values. You just have to store that because the same value is going to get repeated in this whole diagonal. And as long as you fix the format conversion, you're done. So you can store it using just 22 plus 19. 22 plus 19 is 41 values. So you can generalize this very easily. I mean, this is very common sense that if you have an N cross M matrix, then uh, you, you can actually do it as n plus m minus 1 values. Am I right? Uh, yes. Yeah. So this fits into the formula. But again, I'm not the type of guy uh, who's good at remembering formulae. So I would actually do it using this visualization. Right? So you can easily do it. Again, the, 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 the array, the time that the, the size of the array that you need is just 22 elements plus 19 elements, 22 elements for this upper part. 19 elements for the lower part. So just 41 elements. So your answer is 41. That's it. Very simple solution here, right? So cool. Uh, with that, uh, let's, let's just go into the chat window quickly. And uh, somebody asked this very nice question, uh, which I'll answer in just a second. Let me change it to the webcam. So the question here was, uh, why don't we use cache aware algorithms as much? Actually, they're used extensively. Uh, I know libraries uh, in, in mathematical computer science or numerical programming which use cache aware algorithms extensively. It's just that we are not taught that at undergraduate level because uh, they're slightly, I mean, they're not hard, 
But actually, when you learn data structures and algorithms in your BTEC first year or second year, you have not yet studied operating systems and uh, computer organization concepts like cache, etc. already. That's why I think it's not taught. But um, um, in some top universities, they, they, are, they are taught. I mean, it's not that they are not taught. So if you go to MIT's uh, algorithms course, I think if I'm not wrong, it was taught a few years back because that's where I learned cache over algorithms myself. And I started reading other research papers at a later point. But in general, uh, cache aware algorithms uh, are used extensively. It's just that we are not exposed to it as much, as under, at, especially at undergraduate level. So even at graduate level, if you're doing research in, um, uh, in data structures algorithms, if you, if you actually do that as your primary area of thesis, you will encounter a lot of uh, approximate algorithms. You'll see a lot of distributed algorithms. You'll see a lot of cache aware algorithms you'll see a lot of multi-core algorithms and things like that. So that's very common at a graduate level. Cool. Uh, so Ayush has a nice question. His question is, uh, what is relatively easy to achieve a double digit rank in gate or cracking product based companies uh, in coding rounds? I think they're two different things. I've seen people uh, who have not cracked gate who have cracked companies like Amazon and joined there as software engineers. I've seen people who have cracked gate who have not cracked top product based companies. So I've seen both those intersections. But I think in terms of core skill sets, the problem solving skill sets that you need are comparable, if not the same, the skills are slightly different. Gate is looking for breadth of knowledge and some basic problem solving skills, while top product based companies are looking for literally three subjects your programming knowledge, data structures, algorithms, can you actually write good code? Their requirements are different from Git, unfortunately or otherwise. But uh, I think most people who crack Git with some preparation, with some training, uh, they can easily crack top product based companies and vice versa. People who crack these top product based companies, I think uh, if they put in six months of effort, they can crack Git fairly easily. So it's, it's both ways. Cool. Uh, So this is about uh, how to solve new problems in gate. I use oftentimes gate problems are not considered hard in general, and they fall into the standard set of patterns that you have seen in the previous years. There might be a little trickiness added every year, but if you have decent foundations and if you can solve patterns of questions, easy, medium, and tricky that we have seen in the last 10 years, I think you can solve most gate questions in general. The patterns do not change. It's just the amount of trickiness might change slightly. The number of medium level questions might increase slightly every from one year to other year. Again, we have also seen trends where sometimes the question paper gets tricky, suddenly it becomes easy and then it gets tricky. So we have seen all those uh, all those movements in the trickiness, hardness of question. They're not actually hard, they're mostly medium level problems. So um, if you can solve the previous year questions, if you have strong foundational skills, if you have the basic problem solving ability, I think you can solve most gate questions. Cool, I'm happy Pritesh that you're able to solve most of the questions today. That's that's actually, you're in a very good track, no problem. Um, so, one second. Safe rank for IAC MS. So, uh, again, if you're talking about the M, so there is no more MS, I think it's now changed to M Tech by research. Again, I believe if, I, if I'm not wrong, uh, that also has an interview criteria. I think uh, they shortlist candidates in the top few hundred ranks and then uh, conduct interviews. Again, in the last uh, couple of years, they could not conduct these interviews, so the pattern might have changed. But if you're in the top hundred ranks, uh, I think you can comfortably get into IASC, comfortably. How to choose between a processor risk and CISC? Very nice question. So uh, this, is, this is a fast evolving field in general. So if you want battery power optimization, uh, risk is the way to go, but nowadays risk is also compatible, uh, comparably as fast as CISC. Earlier CISC used to be faster, your Intel chips were faster than your Qualcomm chips, but uh, with, with, with new Apple M1 processors, you can, I mean, there, there is proof in the pudding that uh, uh, a risk processor, well-designed, well-architected, carefully built, can even compete with CISC architectures in terms of pure sheer speed while also having battery optimizations. If I have to pick one today, I would pick RISC. Actually, I literally use a RISC processor in almost all my computing devices now, including my laptop. So my bet will be on RISC. So 
so only 200 250 guys got into iat iasc why so and how will this affect future aspirants i think uh, this has been true every year in general category i think if you're in the top 300 ranks uh, you would get into the old iits and iasc and similar institutes the rest of them go to the other institutes like triple ITs and uh, isi kolkata some of the newer iits like for example uh, iit hyderabad which is very good which is comparable to some uh, actually which i would say is better than some of the old iits uh, based on their curriculum and based on their career uh, uh, career opportunities so uh, um, i would say this has been always the trend the number of seats haven't changed significantly so it's a top 300 ranks uh, in general category who get into top iits but we have also seen students who got into good nits we have seen students up to like 800 even 1000 rank who got into good central universities or good triple it's or good nits who have gone on to have the same career opportunities that somebody who went to iit bombay or iisc had so in the long run it really doesn't matter we had one student i think a couple of years back uh, who who got into nit suratkal or nit trichy and he wanted to drop a year. We actually convinced him not to drop and go and join. And he worked very hard during his master's days. And he got the very first day placement at Amazon. So even if he had gone to IIT Bombay or IISC, the outcomes would be very similar, if not the same. So what, what difference did it make? So he didn't waste one year re-preparing for GATE and having all of the pressure in his mind. So our recommendation always is if you're getting into the good universities with good academic curriculum, and most importantly, if you're looking for placements, good career opportunities, just go and join. In the long run, nobody cares where you went to college. Everybody cares about the skills you have, the work that you've done in the last two to three years. Nobody asks me where I went to college uh, if I apply for a job today. So, okay. Uh, so, Bitu is saying, I'm interested in research, but I don't know how to read a research paper. That's what your MTech will teach you. So, don't worry about it. Um, one of my biggest learnings at in Institute of Science was how to read a cutting edge research paper, understand it and be able to implement it. If there is one thing that I took away from IISC, one, one of my most important learnings is I start, I learned how to read research papers in machine learning. I think that's the most, after, I mean, that's the most important takeaway followed by my friends and uh, the, 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 the people that I've met there. That's the second biggest thing. But the first one probably is the ability to read research papers. You'll learn that you're a master's, don't worry right now. Most of us can't read research papers at undergraduate level. So is there an interview for MTech admission in every IIT? No, only some IITs for some programs, not for every program at every IIT, only some. So again, it depends on the program. It depends on the department that is offering it. But uh, just be assured that if you're getting the top 300 ranks, uh, you stand a very good chance of getting, uh, if you're in the general category, you stand a very good chance of getting into most of them, even with an interview. So, we are just finishing the first project uh, in the placement prep with Python. Uh, it will be a very interesting uh, real world problem. Uh, we are just finishing it. We'll wrap it up and uh, share it with you. Uh, hopefully next week. Uh, okay, somebody is asking, what is the difference between an ML engineer and ML scientist? Uh, I'll briefly answer this because it is not the right context, but uh, an ML engineer is like a bridge between the machine learning team and the software engineering team. 50% of the work, they would actually write uh, code to take the to take some of the research work or some of the cutting edge work and productionize it. But they're also expected to know some machine learning, data science, etc. On the other hand, a machine learning scientist is expected to be at the cutting edge of data science is expected to be at the cutting edge of data science and machine learning. So the expectation of depth of knowledge is higher for a machine learning scientist. For a machine learning engineer, they're expected to be able to write very good code comparable to typical software development engineers, in addition to having some, some understanding of data science and machine learning techniques. Cool. Uh, so, uh, Shavik says, uh, for interviews for MS programs at uh, various universities, what are the most important points? Again, that depends a lot on the interview panel. So typically, I'm not saying all places, but typically it's, it's a one-to-many interview where you'll have three or four professors interviewing you. 
and they could pick up any topic from your undergraduate work. Some professors try to focus on the project work that you've done in your BTEC. Some professors ask you, what is your favorite subject in the whole GATE syllabus? And ask you, and they could ask you questions on that. So, I mean, if you're comfortable with GATE syllabus, if you understand, again, the reason we have created some of our content from an applied perspective is because faculty members do ask this in interviews. Like, why do we need cash? What happens if there is no cash? Right? I mean, I, if somebody says, hey, uh, my, my favorite subject is computer organization or operating systems, they might ask you questions like these. If you say my favorite subject is probability statistics, they'll ask you some, some math problem and say, hey, can you prove this? Right? If you say it's data structures algorithms, they'll modify the problem slightly and say, hey, can you solve it? So most of those questions will be at gate level, but unlike gate, which is objective, these questions could be subjective. Right? So, but if you know the concepts in, at gate level, cracking this is fairly straightforward. Cool. Uh, let me just look at other questions. Uh, what do you think? Uh, again, um, in terms of computer science, please don't think AI and machine learning is the only thing that's there in computer science. Um, because that, that's a very, very big misunderstanding. I've seen brilliant work being done in a lot of areas, including including areas like compiler design. Right. So. So please don't be in that uh, in that hyped world that machine learning and AI is the only area. Please try and pick your favorite area of choice. For example, when I was learning machine learning and AI, when I picked it up, it was not it was not the cool thing to be, right? Because there weren't enough machine learning and AI jobs um, when I graduated or when I was studying at IASC. Most people joined as software engineers or research engineers at various companies and machine learning was not that fancy in those days. So I picked machine learning and I got a little lucky to be honest with you, but I picked it because I really liked it. So, I mean, if you like operating systems, be good at it because there is so much scope in operating systems. Imagine everything from a smartwatch to, to, to goggles, you have to start uh, to smart glasses in the future. You have to design cutting edge operating systems. Like imagine how much work would go into designing or optimizing an operating system or device drivers for the next generation of computing devices, right? So there is, you pick any area in computer science, there is still great work to be done ahead of you. So don't, don't be myopic. Don't think too short term that I'll just do machine learning AI. Uh, So somebody asks a very nice question. This is from Pushpak. Is IIIT Hyderabad's fee of about two and a half lakhs per semester, do you think it's worth it? Uh, it's a very nice question. Uh, we have one of our co-founders, Naveen, who manages the whole gate, who's also studied at IIIT Hyderabad. And we had this discussion and the logic is as follows. IIIT doesn't get funding uh, very similar to what IITs and IASC gets from uh, the Ministry of Information Technology or the Ministry of Education and things like that. So what do they do? They charge from students because they're able to give that ROI, the return on investment. Suppose if you're spending some X, IIIT placements are really, really good. I mean, I think they're comparable to what you get at IIT Bombay or IASC or any of the top universities. So their argument is, if you're if you're preparing you and giving if you're giving you those career opportunities, I mean, um, uh, and if you're getting like 18, 20 lakhs compensation, this fee is fair. Which, which I do agree with because they don't have the same level of funding that a typical IA. So where, where does IIT fund your education? Like IASC, right? It used to give me 8,000 rupees stipend and I think I paid some 9,000 rupees tuition fee per year. My education was funded by the taxpayers. To, let's be honest here. Okay. So it, it is India's taxpayers. Everybody who bought a biscuit packet to everybody who paid 1 crore rupees in taxes, everybody funded my education. Because the Ministry of Education, which was called, which was then called Ministry of Human Resources and Development, funded this whole thing, and of course Ministry of Science, Ministry of Space, all of them also funded in the Indian Institute of Science. IIIT doesn't have the same funding, so they again you can't run away from economics 101. They have to raise capital, they have to raise money to to pay the costs of education, right? Because they're not getting the same funding that IIT would get. So they charge from the students, and they're very clear about it. They're like, you pay X. You're, you're, we'll train you, you have the skills, we'll train you and uh, you get brilliant compensations comparable to anywhere else and so why not? So that, that's, that, that's their deal. Uh, so somebody is asking about NVIDIA's GPU monopoly. I think that's almost dying, don't worry about it. With, um, with modern TPUs that Google is making, 
and also a lot of custom chips that uh, various companies are making for machine learning workloads including uh, uh, including the chips that you have in your modern uh, Apple processors or Apple Silicon processors, which have dedicated uh, uh, machine learning units. I think uh, NVIDIA GPU's uh, monopoly is not a problem. Don't worry about it. So Amin says, uh, is, is Triplet Hyderabad a good idea if, if, if you can't afford it? Uh, I don't think it's a problem because uh, very likely you'll get uh, education loan at very favorable interest rates. And if I'm not wrong, you can pay that off uh, in, in, in a couple of years after you graduate. So in the long run, it's not a problem, to, to be honest with you. I mean, just look at people who go to top universities like Stanford Business School or Harvard Business School. The fee is exorbitant, but their opportunities are also brilliant that they can pay off these loans very quickly. Right. So it's, it's not such a big problem. Uh, you will get uh, you'll get no questions asked loan from some of the best banks in India and you'll be able to repay it in a couple of years. That's not a problem. The same is true with ISB. I mean, even IMs are charging a lot of money nowadays for their MBA program because they are like, okay, you pay. I mean, they, those guys know business much better than any of us, right? So they're like, you pay X, you get brilliant compensations. You can repay this money in two to three years. Done. Problem solved. So why not pay? Because we are adding that additional value for uh, in your education. Cool. Uh, so Pranav says, what about blockchain? Again, blockchain is a very cool idea. Uh, I'm sure it has a lot of impact in finance, banking, um, agreements and things like that. But I've not seen it take off as well as I would like it to take off. Of course, I know the fundamentals behind it. I've played around with it a little, but uh, I can't talk about its future because I don't understand where it is headed very well, like the way I understand machine learning. So uh, we'll do the marks distribution videos for each. That's that's a good point, Ayush. Uh, we'll, we'll surely push that out. So we'll be doing it as we do each of these subjects. I think uh, uh, we are just lined up to do data structures and algorithms early next week. So as we do each of these subjects, we're planning to push those marks distribution live session or uh, videos. Don't worry about not being able to pay back if you join IIIT Hyderabad. I mean, you can work hard, get a good job, and you can easily pay it back in a couple of years. Not a problem. Again, you can reach out to uh, to our team. Naveen would probably take that question because he has been through the journey himself. So uh, Prashant says, can I join ISRO or DRDO after master's if I get a good gate rank? Oh, yes. So most of these universities have DRDO or ISRO coming for placements. Even if they don't come for placements, you can easily apply for DRD and ISRO. And if you're applying from a top university, uh, very likely they'll be happy to take you. So that path, again, I, I've had friends of mine uh, who have graduated from an Institute of Science who wanted to join ISRO and DRDO, uh, who comfortably got in through campus placements or uh, again, uh, you have all the credentials. You can easily crack their exam, even if they ask you to take an exam. Somebody saying which chair I'm using. I don't even know, guys. I just bought a reasonable chair in Amazon. As simple as that. I just try to use basic ergonomic stuff because I sit in front of my computer for so long. Basic stuff. Would GATE be useful to get into foreign universities? We know that NUS, National University of Singapore, take, uh, admits Indian students through GATE. I don't know what's the situation been for the last couple of years given uh, all the COVID pandemic and things like that. But NUS is also a very good university, really good university. I've had friends who have done their PhDs from there and terrific place, great research community, one of the best universities in Asia. Um, again, uh, that, that's one place you can consider. Again, I've not uh, been up to date about uh, the NUS process, especially in the last two years with the pandemic. So we don't know how things will pan out next year. Uh, do PSUs, ISRO, DRDO come for campus placements to IITs? Some IITs, not all. Again, it's mostly the IITs and IISC which invite them. Even if they don't come for placement, it should be easy for you to get in. Cool. Uh, suggestions for test series. Very nice question. So our recommendation always, uh, if you're a test series enrolled student, is uh, when, you're, when you're finishing any topic in any subject, please take the topic test. Once you finish the subject, take the subject tests. Once you finish two to three subjects, take the multi-subject tests. Keep all of your, I think there are 10 grand tests and eight mock tests. Use them for your second iteration. It's that simple. That's how we designed the whole test series also. 
बिल्कुल रवि इज माई वन ईयर जूनियर एट आई एस या सो आई नो एम दैट वे सो वाई आई अंडरस्टैंड सो समर इज आस्किंग वाई आई अंडरस्टैंड टॉपिक आफ्टर टू टू थ्री मंथ्स इवन विदाउट रिवाइजिंग सो वॉट हैपन्स इन मेनी ऑफ अ लर्निंग इज वाई आफ्टर यू लर्न your mind subconsciously revises these again this happens a lot in dreams if you're struggling to solve a problem and if you keep it in your mind often times you wake up at 6 or 7 am and uh, it just strikes you as a lightning bolt that you get the answer this happens to lot of us so my suggestion is uh, often times when you read a concept when you put in your effort it is subconsciously brewing in your head just like a good beer or a or a wine right so it's it's brewing in your head and that's why we say when you revise it one week later you might get actually a better perspective or when you revise it a month later you might get a better perspective than you got the first time so think of it like a concept brewing in your mind subconsciously getting revised this happens a lot uh, to most humans so uh, probably that's what is happening to you also so i you says i'm not able to think of optimized code in interview prep again ayush uh, nobody thinks of optimized code on day 0 again most companies would be okay even if you don't write the best time complexity space complexity algorithm as long as you write a reasonable one i think that's important to grasp so what you have the most important thing in most uh, interviews at top companies is can you write clean code handling on boundary cases with reasonable time complexity reasonable space complexity you don't have to write the most optimal code and it's a skill that is built over time just like gate prep just like gate prep it takes time to solve step by step and it requires practice that's why in our interview prep course we have about 200 solved problems that one of my co-founders satish and i solved together right we we start from easy brute force solutions to more optimized solutions so the idea there is through these 200 problems you understand the thought process and you build it and then we have 300 practice problems on top of it right so that's the whole idea there cool uh i think i think we have answered most of the most of the questions here somebody has a nice question how to learn master theorem without remembering the formula prashant at deriving master theorem especially the extended versions of it is is uh, slightly time time taking again you can't do it in an examination so what i would recommend in the setting of the gate examination it's better you remember it it's all about comparison between a and b power k if you think about it logically right again in the standard uh, formulation so uh, i i would i would if i were taking the gate exam today i would remember it and revise it and write it down 3 4 times so that i don't forget it I do the same thing with uh, network packets in uh, in computer networks. I never remember that structure of a TCP packet or a UDP packet. I always forget it. So I take a piece of paper and write it down. This is what all these things that I have to remember. Typically, those are the things that I revise maybe two three days before the examination. That's what I often do because I have a very very bad memory. But again, deriving it is not impossibly hard. But it's time taking that you would waste time in the examination. but it's a good exercise in general probably after you because i remember deriving master theorem from first principles during my masters days right it it was a nice uh, mental exercise but in the examination it might not be very helpful cool uh so according to you which are the subjects in which we can get full marks in gate i would say dld very easy to get full marks toc if there is no question from undecidability um compiler design very easy to get good marks um these are the these are the, these are the subjects that come to the top of my mind which you can easily score 90 to 100% marks again you can go to our website where we give you a list of topics uh list of subjects in terms of how much how easy is it to score marks in these subjects right so please check them cool uh, i think we have answered a good chunk of questions again see you the coming week and all the very best stay safe bye bye